Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Baldwin. I'm Director of the Energy Change Institute at the Australian National University, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon, which will be the public forum on how do we certify the amount of carbon embedded in hydrogen fuels. Uh, we have a, uh, a panel of experts uh, ready to present uh, in a few minutes. Uh, we might uh, just wait until uh, most people are now joining us. Uh, but let me start off by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And in our case, that's the Ngunnawal people uh, here in Canberra and uh, pay our respects to their elders past, present and future. So just uh, to give you a bit of background uh, about today's webinar and a few housekeeping uh, rules. Uh, we have, uh, as I said, a panel of experts who will present their perspective on uh, the various aspects of uh, certifying carbon in hydrogen fuels. Uh, they will have uh, an opportunity to uh, do that uh, over roughly uh, 10 or 15 minutes each. Uh, and uh, following that, uh, we will have a uh, discussion amongst the panel members about a few questions that arise from their presentation. And then we'll open up the entire proceedings to you, the audience, uh, to ask your questions of the panel members and uh, we will then uh, uh, finish that um, at around about 5.30 or so. Uh, so if you would like uh, to uh, ask a question, uh, we have an opportunity to do that uh, for you uh, using the uh, question and answer panel. Uh, you can see that uh, down at the bottom of your screen uh, so I'd encourage you to go on there and to uh, ask your questions as we're going along and then we will uh, select uh, a number of questions uh, to uh, answer uh, for the panel in the last part of the, of the webinar. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I can see that uh, more people are joining us so uh, I might um, now uh, just uh, give a quick uh, introduction of our uh, panel members, and I'll talk about each of them individually, of course, as they come on. Uh, but we have a, a panel of experts this afternoon to talk about our uh, topic, which is how do we certify the amount of carbon embedded in hydrogen fuels? Uh, we uh, would like to welcome this afternoon, Rebecca Thompson from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources, and in particular from the Hydrogen Task Force there, which is uh, looking at uh, certification amongst many other things. Uh, on the uh, way to uh, Australia uh, participating in the hydrogen economy down the track. Uh, from the ANU, uh, we have Dr. Emma Aisbert, uh, and in particular, Emma is a member of the ANU Grand Challenge, Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific, and is the Associate Director of Research of that Grand Challenge. Uh, we also have Penelope Howarth from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, uh, who is actually on secondment to the Grand Challenge, uh, where Emma and I uh, also work. Uh, and uh, Penelope uh, will be talking to us about particular aspects of uh, ammonia as a hydrogen fuel. And then uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. John Soderbaum from ASIL Allen Consulting. And John will be bringing an industry perspective uh, to this entire question. So that's our panel and uh, we will uh, hear from them uh, in, uh, in that order. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, start by introducing uh, Rebecca. So Rebecca Thompson uh, has, uh, as I said, a, a role in the hydrogen strategy team at the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And she's the project lead on hydrogen certification, uh, having uh, worked in the team uh, for a little bit over a year now. Uh, and, uh, and having had previous roles in climate change and energy policy, uh, including early work on the long-term climate strategy, the safeguard me mechanism on the renewable energy target and in the New Zealand emissions trading scheme. Uh, so welcome, Rebecca, and uh, you uh, now have the opportunity uh, to tell us about the thinking around hydrogen and uh, other hydrogen fuel certification uh, from the perspective of the hydrogen strategy team in your department. Okay, thanks Ken and thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, as Ken said, I'll be speaking to you about the work that the Australian Government is doing on hydrogen certification. Um, did, did you have my slides, Ken? Or? 
Or desking, I say. Yeah. Otherwise, I can just talk. That's okay. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, as I said, um, speaking to you about the work the Australian government is doing on hydrogen certification. Um, and if we can move to the next slide. Okay, so I thought I'd just begin with explaining why we need a certification scheme. What is it? Um, I guess um, we're all interested in hydrogen because it has potential as a low emissions fuel and it can be used in place of fossil fuels in a range of applications to reduce emissions. It produces no carbon emissions when it's used, but there can be emissions associated with its production. Most hydrogen is produced today using natural gas and water, which results in emissions. But if it's produced through electrolysis using renewable ele electricity, then no emissions are released. And if it's produced from a fossil fuel and these emissions are captured at a high level and permanently stored, then we can substantially reduce the emissions and the hydrogen can be considered clean. So these clean methods for producing hydrogen are currently more expensive than the traditional methods. Um, so if consumers are interested in hydrogen for its potential as a clean fuel and are prepared to pay more for the clean fuel, then they want some level of assurance that it is clean. And so a certification scheme is a way of providing a consistent and accurate approach to measuring the emissions associated with hydrogen production and giving consumers the assurance that they need. On to the next slide, please. Okay. The development of a certification scheme is a key action as agreed by Australian government in the National Hydrogen Strategy, which was released last year. And the strategy set up, sets out a broad approach to certification. It recognises that a globally consistent scheme would be ideal and suggests that Australia should seek to take a lead role in the development of an international scheme. And any Australian domestic scheme should build on or harmonise with international schemes. The strategy proposed that we could initially develop a simple scheme that verifies and tracks production technology and in line with the technology neutral approach in the strategy, all production technologies would be considered. And it would also track carbon emissions and production location. This could be built on over time. This approach to certification means that we do not need to set definitions of green or low emissions hydrogen. Rather, countries could set their own definition with reference to agreed international standards. On to the next slide, please. Um, so the Australian government has been working both internationally and domestically on the development of a certification scheme. On the international side, we've been participating in the International Partnership for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells in the Economy Production Analysis Task Force. That's a bit of a mouthful, we'll call it IPHE for short. Um, and then this seems to be the main international forum where hydrogen certification is being discussed or among governments anyway. Um, IPHE has around 21 members all together and on this task force, um, most of the main players are represented, including France, Japan, Korea, Germany, the USA and the EU, among others. The, uh, this task force is aiming to describe a methodology to assess the emissions associated with hydrogen production by the second quarter of 2021. But um, obviously a full international standard would take um, some time to develop after this. Um, on to the next slide, please. So on the domestic front, we've been consulting with the Australian industry to understand what industry would like from a scheme. And this includes through a survey released in June, um, which was followed up by a workshop that we held just last week. And from the survey, we heard that stakeholders want a scheme that ideally starts pretty soon. 68% wanted a scheme by 2022. And they also wanted a scheme that is aligned or consistent with approaches taken internationally. So around 75% of stakeholders thought an international scheme is more important or that an international and domestic schemes are equally important. However, there might be trade-offs between these two objectives, between acting quickly and achieving international alignment. Um, other, scheme, other themes coming from the survey um, were that stakeholders want a scheme that transparently and accurately accounts for emissions associated with hydrogen production. They want a scheme that's simple and aligns with existing frameworks, and they want a scheme that's tra credible, trusted, and has provision for independent verification. Um, on to the next slide, please. All right, now getting into some of the design features of a scheme. And the first one is defining the boundary. 
Um, boundaries refer to the part of the hydrogen value chain that we're seeking to certify, and this determines the emissions coverage of the certification scheme. The diagram I've put on is one you might see more than once this afternoon, um, but that's okay. It might take you a while. Um, but basically, it shows the various choices that could be made regarding boundaries. At the broadest end of the spectrum, you could count everything. You could have a full life cycle view of the system where you would count everything from the emissions embodied in the capital equipment used to make the hydrogen, the emissions associated with production, through to the end use and even disposal of the product. Or you could take a narrower view and just talk about the emissions occurring at the production facility. Basically, the smaller the boundary, the easier it is to manage and do, but the larger boundary provides a more complete picture of the carbon footprint. Certify, which is the leading um, scheme, hydrogen certification scheme at the moment in Europe, takes a well to gate approach. And this includes emissions associated with any fossil fuel extraction, transport of these fossil fuels, and the emissions associated with producing the hydrogen. And in this diagram, that's those first three things within that first box. Um, through our survey, around a quarter of respondents indicated some appetite for system boundaries that were beyond Weltergate. So maybe life cycle emissions or including that next transport and distribution step. But there also seems to be a fair amount of support both domestically and internationally for taking Weltergate as a starting point, as this is relatively easy to do. What else we need to cover and how quickly is under consideration. But Australian stakeholders notice, have noted the importance of certifying energy carriers, particularly ammonia. So this might need to be considered in parallel. And Penn has a whole presentation for you on ammonia, so she can explain what I mean here in, a, in more detail. Um, on to the next slide, please. Um, so once we've worked out the boundary, we need to agree on some methods for accounting for emissions within the boundary. Um, and we have some existing frameworks that we could draw on here, such as the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting System, or ENGAS for short. And through the survey, we heard a pretty strong preference for aligning with our existing frameworks, with around 40% of re respondents expressing interest in aligning with ENGAS. Um, Certify is based on international ISO standards that relate to environmental management and the carbon footprints of products. And this is slightly different to ENGAS, but, but we can probably work to align them. Um, on, on to the next slide, please. Um, other considerations raised through submissions in the workshop include various options for governance, um, whether you would have a government-led or an industry-led scheme, or what are the various roles for government and industry in this work, and whether an international body would be involved over time and whether we should provide additional flexibility by permitting hydrogen producers to offset any remaining emissions with Australian carbon credit units or another similar unit. Um, and the last slide. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be an international scheme that we could simply join up to. Um, so we need to work out how we balance these objectives of timing, implementing something soon and being internationally aligned. Um, so a way forward could involve sort of starting to develop a domestic scheme that leverages our existing frameworks and tries to make them as consistent as we can with what we know about international schemes as they evolve. This could help to shape international processes. However, we might need to ad adjust our approach as global markets evolve over time. Um, the department has engaged energetics to, do, to help us develop options for a certification scheme. And this report is due by the end of October. Um, following this, we plan to release a discussion paper around November, setting out a proposed approach for comment. Um, we would like to start some trials and methodologies in early 2021, um, if we can, and we envisage these would run for around 12 months. Um, this positions a domestic scheme to start around mid-2022 or early 2023. Of course, um, during this process, we would continue to engage internationally with IPAT and other bilateral par partners and adjust our approach as necessary. So I guess in, in summary, uh, our approach, I think, is to start with an approach that is simple and can be built on over time. All right, thank you. I think that that's my presentation. Wonderful, thank you very much, Rebecca, uh, for so clearly outlining uh, the international context for this discussion and also uh, how Australia's uh, role feeds into this. And of course, uh, 
Australia has uh, an enormous opportunity here as a potential supplier of hydrogen uh, for a number of economies around the world. Uh, so we need to be in on the ground floor in terms of setting the parameters for a certification scheme uh, in order that that suits our, our best interests. So thank you very much for making that presentation uh, from the hydrogen strategy team's perspective from the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Emma Aisbert. Emma is a fellow at the School of Regulation and Global Governance at the uh, uh, College of Asia and Pacific. Uh, she's also Associate Director of Research for the ANU Grand Challenge, Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific. Uh, so uh, Emma has a background uh, in a range of disciplines, which uh, is one of the reasons that she's uh, the uh, Associate Director for our multidisciplinary team in the Grand Challenge. Uh, she has background in economic globalization, environmental policy, developing countries and political economies, and uh, was originally an engineer, so uh, brings in all of those uh, talents and expertise. Uh, she's best known for her work on international investment agreements, uh, where she's been working with uh, both uh, academia and in uh, policy development. And uh, she's uh, been an invited expert at the OECD and the UN Commission on Trade and Development. Uh, she's uh, provided policy advice uh, to developing countries uh, through uh, the UK government's TAF2 Plus initiative. Uh, so welcome, Emma, and uh, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Ken. Um, and I can share my own slides um, to make things a bit easier at your end. So firstly, can everyone hear me well enough? Yeah? Okay. And can you see the slides? Yes, no, yes. Okay. Um, all right, I'll take it away. So uh, I think I'd like to take this opportunity today to talk about something a, a little narrower than I think the rest of the panel is talking about. But in some sense, it's also broader because uh, we're hearing increasingly from the government um, this concept of technology neutrality. It's turning up in the hydrogen strategy. It's turning up in the low emissions um, technology investment roadmap. And so I think it's really timely to talk about what technology neutrality actually means and how would that look in the context of a certification scheme for hydrogen fuels. So what is technology neutrality? If you look around the academic literature, uh, there's a few different definitions. A lot of them sort of actually referring to formal law. With regard to policy, one of the, I think, most useful definitions is that by Wiley from 2015, which says, um, and I just realised I should put on slideshow, that technology um, neutrality means that policy does not favour any particular means of achieving the desired goal. Specifically, a policy must equally support um, all technologies capable of achieving this outcome. And so sort of contrast that with what technology neutrality does not mean. Um, technology neutral policy does not aim, despite I think what a lot of people seem to believe, to ensure that all technologies have an equal or fair chance of it succeeding in the market. And I think this concept of what a fair competition is, is something because we know fairness means a different thing in a different context to every different person. And I'm, I'm going to elaborate on that in a minute. Um, technology neutral policy also doesn't seek to maximise the number of technologies competing in a market. If there is a clear winner, then it lets there be a clear winner. Um, and it certainly does not aim to ensure that existing dominant technologies and incumbents maintain their competitive advantage. So to, to use an analogy, um, let, let's think about horse race policy, right? So our policy objective is to travel two kilometres on horseback as fast as possible. What would technology neutral policy look like to support that objective? You would provide a flat, clean grass track, well-functioning starting gates, and you would ensure that access to racing silks and jockeys are not a barrier to entry, that they're cheap and accessible to all the technologies. Note that the possible outcome of this is that there isn't a lot of horses in this race. It could be through self-selection when everyone is treated equally, that only one horse enters. If you're far up and it's the you know, 1930s Melbourne Cup, you really, if he hadn't been handicapped, wouldn't have bothered entering. You wouldn't have bothered paying the entry price, right? So this is in, the important thing to note about the difference between technology neutral policy and policy which is trying to keep all technologies in the race. 
right? So to, to further take this analogy, it risks too far. Um, what would technology bias horse rates look like? What we actually did back, back then and continue to do in the Melbourne Cup, you'd actually handicap the, the best technology if you want by putting weights in its saddle. But there are also a whole lot of ways that you could implicitly bias things. You could, for example, if I like, I can't, actually can't remember, but let's presume he was, he was the best horse for a clean dry track. Um, if you want to tilt the scales a bit away from him or um, you could do something implicitly biased by soaking the track and making it muddy, making the dirty horse have an implicit advantage. Or if your goal is actually long-term, like zero emissions by 2050, you could have your goal set at something like 2030 and that would also be implicit bias if your actual goal is 2050. In the analogy for Farlap, it would be you would decide the winner of the Melbourne Cup based on who is in front of the one kilometre mark. Right? And so what would this policy come out with? Many different outcomes. It's a much less clear outcome, right? Because you will have many more horses in the race. It might be it, you will have achieved pushing Farlap harder, right? So that the competition will have made Farlap give his absolute best, which is often, I think, what's motivating people to think that more technologies in the race means a better outcome. Because it does mean that Farlap can't sit around eating oats and sitting around in his stall all day. He's got to train hard. He's got to run his heart out. But when he does win, he may still, he's likely to have done it slower than he would have had you had a truly technology neutral race set up. And even worse, you could have an inferior horse winning in a, in a time slower than Farlap would have. All right, so it's not that hard to see the links here to, to the context of a certification scheme, right? So what is our policy objective? According to the Australian National Hydrogen Strategy, we want a clean, innovative, safe and competitive hydrogen fuels industry. Uh, as Rebecca said, the real motivation here is to decarbonise our energy systems, right? So really, um, my, my view of what the objective is, um, is large scale production of hydrogen from fuels which are compatible, compatible with decarbonisation objectives. So what would technology neutral certification policy look like? It would provide transparency about both the production technologies and the emissions all the way along the supply chain. Now, we all understand that this can get really costly, right? If you want to get the emissions right down to the 0.1%, to the then, then there's going to be a trade-off here in terms of what's feasible and not too costly and therefore be becoming a barrier to entry to the market and what is actually giving the information that consumers need. So, so I'm, I'm saying 10% here. It's something that I think should be open to debate is, is how precise do we need what is too much of the emissions to leave out of that global supply chain if we're, if we're only looking at certain parts of it? And so what's the possible outcome of this? It may well be that you get um, really strong growth in renewable-based hydrogen fuels. And it may well be that incumbent fossil fuel interests in this country lose out, okay? That, that's an actual possibility that technology neutral policy might actually lead to. Um, what would technology bias certification look like? Um, you might have a binary as opposed to just certifying what are the emissions. You might define what's clean and what's not clean. And you might define clean as something that actually most consumers wouldn't consider clean. Another thing you might do is you might draw boundaries or scope in a way that includes important components of supply chain emissions. Even worse, you could define your scope in a way that means important components are included. For example, the emissions associated with electricity for electrolysis and excluded for, um, for fossil fuel based, for example, fugitive emissions from the extraction of the gas that you use to make your hydrogen. Okay, these would actually be quite seriously technology biased policies. What is the possible outcome of this sort of policy? The renewables based hydrogen um, production, which is ultimately what we're going to need if we're going to get to zero emissions, um, will not move down the cost curve as fast as it otherwise would. You're not going to get far up getting to that fishing, finishing line as fast as it otherwise would. And even worse, because you need three times as much gas to produce the hydrogen for the equivalent amount of energy is just burning that gas directly and fugitive emissions are substantive. In, in addition, the emissions from producing hydrogen are substantial if they're not captured and stored effectively. You could actually end up 
increase in global emissions in the energy system, supposedly trying to produce a lower emission fuel. So just to, to put some numbers behind this, and I thank um, our team, um, particularly Fiona Beck um, and, and Reza for doing these great calculations and great diagrams, just to put some actual numbers behind this. So this is showing some indicative emissions for hydrogen production um, at different parts of the supply chain. And I think the really important thing to see here is the size of those feedstock emissions for, um, for gas generated hydrogen, okay? So if you're leaving out feedstocks because they're scope three, then you are leaving out um, the, the bulk when it comes, if you're talking about with serious amounts of carbon capture and storage, the bulk of the emissions from that sort of hydrogen production. And even compared to SMR from gas um, without any carbon capture and storage, you can see that those feedstock emissions are about 25% of the total amount. So this is actually a certification scheme that ignores those potentially classified as scope three emissions um, actually is leaving out you know, a very large fraction of the actual emission from, from the supply chain here. So this is why those boundaries, and this is why you're going to keep seeing these boundary diagrams turning up in people's presentations, the boundaries of the certification scheme really matter and they definitely have implications for which, um, <laughs> which technologies and indeed which fuels, as Penn will talk about, um, have implicit advantage from the certification scheme. So in conclusion, technology neutrality sounds great and has a lot to be said for it if done well. However, if misunderstood or misapplied, it can produce both inefficient and unfair outcomes. And as I said, even lead this new clean fuel to lead to more emissions than we have currently from using gas itself. Technology neutral certification properly done will ensure transparency of the substantive emissions all along the supply chain. Admittedly, that is going to be tricky, particularly in the timelines that we're talking about. So we might need something like a modular approach, but we do need very clear, to be very clear so that firms can make long-term and medium-term investment decisions about where these schemes are going and that they will include all the substantive parts of the supply chain in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. And... Uh... We'll now move on to our next presenter. Uh, so uh, Penelope Howarth uh, is joining us uh, uh, at the ANU in the Grand Challenge Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific as a, uh, a contributor to our research program. Uh, but he Penelope hails from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade as uh, her, uh, her workplace. Uh, so uh, Penn uh, has a uh, a uh, long uh, history of contribution to the energy space. Uh, she was uh, working uh, with APEC, uh, the Energy Working Group, and uh, heading that up uh, for a number of years in Singapore. Uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, benefited greatly from her experience in joining the Grand Challenge uh, and working on the certification issues surrounding ammonia. So uh, Penelope, please uh, uh, be welcome and, uh, and provide your insights on this particular topic. And you need to unmute. Penelope, you need to unmute. I've got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ross. Okay. Um, sorry about that, everyone. Um, and can you go. make it full screen? Yes, I'm working on that. There we go. Okay, and take it back. So, so yes, as Ken mentioned, um, I'm a research fellow at the ANU's Grand Challenge um, uh, for the last six months or so, and um, I've been uh, working with a, a quite a considerable team um, of, of researchers on ammonia. Um, so, uh, why are we talking just, about them? Ken, can you just make your full screen presentation there? So why are we talking about ammonia? Um, as, as everyone I hope knows, but just in case, um, 
uh, when you add nitrogen to hydrogen uh, through a process called the Hub-Bosch process, which is quite an old technology, it's been used for over 100 years, um, you produce ammonia. Um, so why would you want to produce ammonia uh, rather than shipping hydrogen to Japan, Korea, Germany, wherever, Singapore, um, is because uh, hydrogen is quite difficult uh, to store and transport in a stable way. It needs to be super cool to something like minus 250 degrees and, uh, and it, it's much easier and cheaper to transport ammonia. So you can, um, you can transport hydrogen by converting it to ammonia and then um, shipping the ammonia. So obviously why are we talking about ammonia and hydrogen when obviously there are plenty of other energy sources that have been around a long time? And obviously that has to do with uh, the Paris Agreement and uh, general concern about catastrophic climate change um, and a need to um, decarbonize uh, the energy systems uh, of the world. So all countries are working towards that. Um, one of the interesting things that I've um, sort of, the penny dropped is that um, when you burn ammonia or hydrogen, say in Japan, whether that ammonia or hydrogen was made from fossil fuels in Australia or from renewable energy or from nuclear even, no matter what, once it's in Japan as ammonia or hydrogen and you burn it, it's zero greenhouse gases. So it's a great fuel for Japan. I guess the question as, as um, Emma alluded to is, what are the emissions implications for the country producing uh, that new fuel? And obviously hydrogen is uh, potentially, and ammonia uh, potentially can generate uh, greenhouse gases if produced from fossil fuels. But of course, uh, there are all these definitions that are uh, out there and there are more and more colours every day. It's quite confusing. What's clean, green, blue, grey, turquoise even? People are talking about these colours and uh, I don't know if they're always talking about the same thing. <laughs> so it depends who you ask. What blue is, for instance? Is 60% carbon capture and storage blue or does it need to be 90% um, or 40%? Um, would it include uh, some various different technologies for storing and using the carbon? Depending who you ask. So um, this is background to, to um, the research that I've, I've undertaken. Obviously, um, there will be many buyers and sellers of ammonia and hydrogen uh, in the world economy. And the global playing, playing field, I guess, um, if we all are talking about the same thing, when we talk about what is the price of ammonia or hydrogen per, per kilogram, per tonne, per, and there are all these density issues as well that, that people talk about. So we need to be talking about the same thing, and there needs to be a standard kind of price and measurement of price. And similarly, because the purchase decision is not just about the price, for the consumers, um, the, the consumers will be to one extent or, or, or another interested in how m many greenhouse gas emissions were produced in uh, this ton of ammonia that I'm buying or, or, or hydrogen. So having sort of standardised measures of those two particular things are going to be very important to create a global marketplace that's transparent and uh, people can really uh, have confidence in. So how do we get there? Um, so why do we need to cert uh, certify ammonia? I think um, Rebecca covered that off very well and in more academic speak, we talk about an asymmetry of information market failure where, you know, if you look at an ammonia molecule under the microscope or a hydrogen one, it looks the same, regardless of what technology was used to create it. So you really need some sort of a, a certification system so buyers can, can know what the greenhouse gas profile is of this particular batch of hydrogen or ammonia that they're buying. Um, 
So in terms of, uh, as, as again, uh, Rebecca has mentioned, um, uh, currently the price of uh, low or zero emissions, ammonia or hydrogen, is, is higher than the price of uh, high, well, um, ammonia or hydrogen currently produced through, uh, through fossil fuel production with, with no carbon capture and storage and even uh, with carbon capture, depending on the technology, uh, renewable ammonia may be more expensive, at least initially because uh, production of ammonia from and hydrogen from renewable energy is a relatively immature technology. It's proven, you can do it, but it doesn't have the benefits of you know, 50 years of having produced ammonia at scale. Although if you ask Yara, which is one of the world's biggest ammonia uh, producers, up until I think the 60s, all of the ammonia they produced was uh, from renewable energy, they claim and they only uh, moved to fossil fuels uh, in response to cheap, uh, the, the relatively low price of fossil fuels compared with the renewable resources they had been using till then. So it's back to the future for Yarra. Um, and obviously, uh, whatever we do with certification, the key thing is that when companies uh, offer that certification to their buyers, whether they're in Japan, Germany, you know, uh, Singapore, or or a Korea or anywhere else, um, they, the importers need to recognise that certification system. And it's going to be interesting if the Saudis are selling their ammonia with a different certification system and, you know, Norway is selling it with another one and Chile is selling it with another one. It's going to be an interesting uh, experience for the potential importers. Um, so, uh, hence uh, Rebecca's uh, very important point about international harmonisation. Um, and I will uh, just to reference that there is an, a forthcoming publication that will cover these issues um, from my ANU uh, colleagues, which I'm co-authoring. Um, we've already seen this very important. I find it so helpful visually to be able to look at this. And one of the interesting points with uh, ammonia versus hydrogen certification. This transportation leg um, for after the point of production, I, I, if you have to supercool hydrogen to minus 250 degrees Celsius to move it safely versus minus 25 degrees for ammonia, then surely the transportation leg for hydrogen would be a lot more energy intensive. And if your ship is being run on heavy oil, as a lot of ships are, or LPG or LNG or, or, or a, a green ammonia for that matter, it really will uh, make quite a difference to the transportation emissions, whether you're transporting hydrogen or ammonia. So as Emma uh, sort of uh, highlighted, the boundaries you choose will advantage certain fuels over others. And so it's very important to take a holistic view, view of the various fuels that are competing, for instance, biofuels, hydrogen, ammonia, LNG, um, et cetera. Uh, liquid organic hydrogen car carriers as well are, are in the mix. So, you know, if you've got all those horses running, uh, what sort of things can you do to make sure that it's a, it's a you know, fair race course for everyone? Um, so how do we do it? Um, and I think we already had this uh, from, from Rebecca, but I uh, uh, just want to highlight that the government has pointed out that scope one and scope two carbon emissions are what they're seeking to include, um, not scope three at this stage. Um, so, and other, uh, often when I'm talking about hydrogen or ammonia certification, people say, what about water? Water's a key input, not just electricity, to producing ammonia, for instance, and hydrogen, uh, particularly the hydrogen stage. And there's a lot of uh, questions about water should be included in the certification scheme. So, uh, while we've all agreed to, I think it's SDG 6, the Sustainable Development Goal, um, to, you know, uh, manage water responsibly, um, which is very important for all countries. Um, it's not only important for hydrogen as a fuel, 
it's important for all the other fuels that it's competing with as well. So that really needs to be taken into account if you're designing a water certification system, um, which I suggest might be done diff separately. Uh, certainly at this stage, emissions and technology uh, and production locations seem to be the three uh, elements everyone can agree on, hopefully. So um, just I'll, I'll hurry up now because I think I'm taking too long. Ammonia is obviously um, emerging not just as a hydrogen carrier. You can crack the ammonia back into hydrogen at the destination market, such as in Japan, and they can put the hydrogen back in, into their hydrogen fueled vehicles and just release the nitrogen into the atmosphere. It's not a greenhouse gas and, and it's, uh, it's, it's not a big problem. But there are people designing fuel cells today that will run on ammonia. Why crack it back when you can just run, you know, use the ammonia as ammonia? And this is in particular uh, being looked at in Japan for coal co-firing and uh, that's well into demonstration phase and um, there's an agreement between uh, Australian, I think it's Woodside and, and the big Japanese coal power plant owners to co-fire with ammonia that could bring uh, uh, Japan's coal emissions down significantly by 20% even if they co-fire with 20% ammonia. Um, so that's quite exciting, um, as a, like CCS is also obviously a technology everyone's been looking at for a long time for that. And shipping fuels are very important uh, and huge market that uh, there are engines being designed today in Europe that run on ammonia and, and for that matter, a dual fuel engines with heavy oil or, or LPG that uh, they could build a ship in a few years time that can run on the fossil fuel for the first five years. When the price of ammonia gets low enough, they just switch across without having to rebuild the ship's engine. So it's quite exciting. Um, and we've, uh, ammonia has similar boundary issues with hydrogen, as I've mentioned, but some differences um, and, and very big differences in governance. Um, in that, you know, IPHE is an, a relatively mature organisation for intergovernmental um, negotiation. They've been talking about hydrogen, hydrogen for, I think, about 15 years or so. Um, they haven't been talking about ammonia very much. And uh, there are ammonia-focused uh, organisations that have been talking about ammonia for a similar period, uh, in particular the Ammonia Energy Association. But again, um, also, uh, when we talk about hydrogen, it's not always clear if we're talking about hydrogen fuels or actually talking about hydrogen. So the governance and, and the momentum is very much around hydrogen. My big question uh, is uh, how does that relate to ammonia and the ammonia governance and, and opportunities? Um, so, uh, so for hydrogen certification, some people say, we'll just certify the hydrogen and then we'll tack on the ammonia part and, and Bob's your uncle. But others are saying, well, Actually, we could just certify the ammonia and have the whole scheme. I, I mean, I think uh, obviously hydrogen is a key feedstock for ammonia. So um, having a hydrogen certification system was very helpful for certifying ammonia. So finally, uh, low embedded emissions ammonia certification uh, uh, industry, uh, I think the first uh, P power purchase agreement was signed about a month ago. Uh, for green ammonia out of Saudi Arabia. Um, so they have, uh, they have actually got a uh, green ammonia on the international market purchase agreement. So there are Australian companies wanting to sign such agreements too, and they are asking uh, for ammonia certification to be fast tracked as well. And I'm sure that came through with, uh, with the uh, survey that uh, Rebecca referred to. Um, so how could we leverage ammonia focused forums where all the ammonia stakeholders in industry at least and some academics as well have already been meeting for you know the last 10 years and, and discussing in depth ammonia related issues, um, in particular the Ammonia Energy Association headquarters out, out of New York and um, that has a, an Australian chapter as well as you know other chapters in other countries. So then there's um, 
and the Green Ammonia Consortium of Japan, which is basically an industry-led uh, peak body for the Japanese, uh, where they're talking with potential sellers. And, and who knows, maybe in the future, there may be new architecture around ammonia that is, is being uh, adopted by industry or government. Um, or do we just uh, integrate ammonia into the existing hydrogen uh, uh, architecture? Um, which, you know, I think one has to bear in mind that there are companies backing, for instance, hydrogen as a shipping fuel. Uh, and there are other companies backing ammonia as a shipping fuel. So um, what are the implications of the, of the political sort of dynamics in a hydrogen focused body uh, if they are then requested to do uh, ammonia related uh, work? So that, that probably needs to be considered. Um, so the geopolitical implications of Australia's place supplying ammonia to uh, Asian markets in particular. Um, a lot of the hydrogen architecture is quite, um, a quite Eurocentric, one could say. Uh, IMO has its headquarters in London, IPHE in, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I want to say Paris, but it could be Brussels. Anyway, IPHE is is also a European-based uh, organisation with global membership, of course. Um, uh, but obviously, in the case of Australia, um, we have uh, quite uh, quite a lot of negotiating power in in the and in the Asia Pacific. Um, and how does that play out within those bodies? Um, will be quite interesting, especially if, for instance, I think. Singapore is not a, even a member of IPHE at the moment, is what I had heard. Um, so, you know, that's quite interesting. They're a key market for us, of course, for uh, potentially bunkering huge amounts of ammonia for international shipping in Singapore. Um, and industry are already discussing that with each other, the ammonia industry between Singapore and Australia. Um, so the boundary implications are quite important, as I've mentioned. Um, and there are some technical questions about integrated hydrogen and, nitrogen and, and uh, ammonia plants. And finally, obviously, it really, um, while also looking at the similarities between hydrogen and, 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 and ammonia, there are also differences. Uh, as I mentioned, for instance, in the transportation emissions intensity potentially of, of ammonia versus hydrogen. So one needs to be quite well informed about those differences when perhaps designing a certification system, which is uh, technology neutral in its objective. And that's uh, all from me. Thanks very much for listening. Sorry for um, going on so long. Good, thank you, Penn. Uh, now we have uh, our final speaker, uh, John Soderbaum. Uh, so John uh, is well known in the hydrogen community, uh, having uh, worked uh, for many years in ASIL Allen as Director of uh, Science and Technology. Uh, and uh, he has a long history of contributing to the hydrogen discussion. Uh, back in 2003, the Australian National Hydrogen Study was a project uh, that he was involved in. Uh, he did a report on Australia's hydrogen export opportunities for ARENA. Uh, he worked on the South Australian Government's Green Hydrogen Study and uh, presented a, uh, an issues paper on the injection of hydrogen in the natural gas networks for the National Hydrogen Strategy Task Force. So welcome, John, and uh, very interested to hear your perspective. Thanks, Ken. Let me just see if I can share my screen now. Yeah. Make it a slideshow. Good morning. Hopefully that's coming up. Is that all good, Ken? Excellent. Um, so, so thank you very much. Uh, first of all, Ken, I should thank you for giving me the opportunity to participate in a forum where the, where the women outnumber the men. Well done to you and, and the Energy Change Institute for that. And that's something that uh, uh, my academy is very strong on, and uh, it's good to see it happening. Uh, so before I start, I should make it clear that my presentation is based on a review of 
publicly available information about you know what industry thinks uh, about uh, uh, hydrogen certification and that's uh, comes from the that survey that was mentioned earlier and obviously because of that it doesn't take into account information that might be contained in responses that weren't made public so this means that my numbers might not agree entirely with some of the other numbers um, because they had a access to confidential responses. So the part of a wide variety of uh, responses to the survey, uh, uh, a lot of consultants, a lot of some users of hydrogen, some producers of hydrogen, uh, equipment manufacturers of various kinds, and some industry associations were, were quite interested in, in giving their views. Ken mentioned that hydrogen export opportunities report that I prepared uh, some years, a couple of years ago. Uh, that identified uh, Japan and Korea as, as two potential markets. I mean, since then, uh, other countries have expressed an interest in in, Euro, in, Germ in, sorry, in Australian uh, hydrogen, including Germany. Uh, Singapore has started its own, you know, developing its own hydrogen strategy in fact may have already completed it by now um, and they were another potential market that we identified in that uh, in that study so it's probably important when you're thinking about this is to think about well why are countries talking about hydrogen at all um, well and, and it's mainly because they want to reduce their emissions because they're trying to meet various targets uh, that have been set and that's pretty much the driver for, for getting involved in hydrogen at all. So knowing what amount of, of carbon or what amount of emissions is actually embedded in the hydrogen you're buying or using is very important for these countries and we, we, we know that Japan and Korea have, have both signaled their intention to, their longer term intention to only import essentially carbon-free hydrogen. Um, the certification is, scheme is important for establishing market confidence um, because, you know, it gives, for example, investors confidence to invest in production facilities that are expensive to build and, you know, they need to be confident that somebody's going to buy the hydrogen when it, when it is made. Uh, it also gives consumers confidence that the hydrogen that they've uh, purchased has has a defined and well-known amount of carbon sort of attached with it. As um, uh, as Penelope pointed out, this 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 is the same thing that happens in in the case of certifying ammonia or emissions associated with ammonia production. If you not having a certification scheme or a poorly dis designed one could actually be quite bad because it could limit our access to markets. And that's the last thing that industry would like to see. They want to have access to those markets. Now, the only existing hydrogen certification scheme so far is this one that's been mentioned, uh, the EU scheme. Uh, it talks about green hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen, and it defines that to be around the four and a half kilos of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen. So that's about half the emissions intensity of hydrogen from steam methane reformation uh, without any CCS, without any carbon capture and storage. So steam methane, methane reformation is uh, currently the most common way of making hydrogen today. So as Rebecca noted in her presentation, the industry is very keen to get a certification scheme and they want it to be, when do we want it? Now, basically. Um, they want it sooner than, rather than later. And you can hear, see here the sort of list of preferred start years that I was able to identify in the submissions that actually talked about it. And also their willingness to wait for uh, a number of years beyond what they're preferred start year was. And 
there was a relatively low tolerance for for, for waiting for this um, scheme to come into effect. Most people certainly wanted it in. We want, we're not prepared to have any delay and maybe a year at most. There was a long, there was a strong desire to to essentially not miss the boat. I think was the was the sort of way I might sum it up. The speed which with this is sort of happening or with that people would like it to happen makes me think to the Australian, back to that report, the first report I wrote on hydrogen, which was back in 2003. And that study, the Australian National Hydrogen Study, uh, that recommended that we should have a national hydrogen strategy. So it took 16 years for that recommendation to actually be implemented. Um, I think, I suspect that the certification scheme will come about much faster than that. But patience is definitely a virtue in this business. So what sort of certi certification scheme did industry want? Um, so only 15% uh, of stakeholders identified domestic uh, certification scheme as a priority. About a third were more interested in having an international scheme and about half thought that having both was important. So the support for domestic scheme was mainly from businesses, businesses who saw sales in Australia as their main opportunity. And that may be sales of not necessarily hydrogen, but equipment for using it or producing it or whatever. Um, I should add that the, those saying that two schemes were equally important almost unanimously thought that a single scheme applying both internationally and domestically was the best approach to, to have. Although some noted that um, it might actually be easier to start with a domestic scheme where you don't have to worry about too much about what other international partners are saying and then gradually transition or incorporate the, the, a broader international scheme into that scheme. Have I missed a slide there? Ah, yes. So what are the most important features that, that uh, uh, these respondents or stakeholders identified as being, as being useful to include in a certification scheme? So each, each uh, stakeholder was asked to identify three, three different uh, um, items to, that were, they felt should be included. And this slide shows that some top three ranked features listed by the respondents by the priority uh, order. So in other words, um, respondents who identify uh, items as a first priority, they thought that accurately reflecting the carbon content was the most appropriate thing to include in a, in a certification scheme. It was just a question of what, what order um, respondents uh, refer to them, the, the uh, various features in, because sometimes the, the um, uh, transparency was, was second and sometimes transparency was first, depends. Um, transparency, in fact, as mentioned by Rebecca, is, is something that that's features strongly among the priorities. Technology neutrality, uh, as, as uh, mentioned by Emma, was, was referred to as a positive feature by about 10% of the responses that I read. So this slide uh, shows the top four features that stakeholders nominated across all those different three different levels of priority. The top feature there was transparency. Um, stakeholders really wanted to know precisely how the certification scheme worked. Next, what, next uh, uh, most commonly mentioned uh, feature was carb, what I call carbon content. And it was just my nomenclature for this particular desire, which really boiled down to industry wanting to have confidence that the scheme would accurately represent the amount of emissions associated with the hydrogen they were buying. Uh, and uh, in fact, several stakeholders have, uh, um, also mentioned the uh, importance of, uh, at some point, including uh, information about the source of water that was being used too. Ease of operation or simplicity, as mentioned by Rebecca, uh, was, was next. 
followed by compatibility with other schemes. In the context of compatibility, the respondents um, were there worried about making sure that the scheme, whatever scheme we had in Australia was A, consistent across jurisdictions within Australia and also uh, between Australia and other countries overseas. So um, they didn't want to see uh, schemes where jurisdictions differed in their approach, which I don't think we're heading down that path, but that was just an, uh, an interesting perspective or an important perspective. They were also, um, stakeholders were also asked what they thought, what is the important thing to avoid in a cert certification scheme? Um, so the responses are pretty much a, a mirror uh, or a image of the features that they wanted to include. So things like complexity or inconsistency with other schemes were mentioned among the sort of most, most common features that should be avoided. Um, Rebecca talked about governance models um, uh, and whether schemes should be government led or industry led. There were a few respondents who mentioned the governors, not many, but a few, um, but they, it was clear that there were concerns around, um, at least in terms of the, 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 the views that were expressed that I read, of not letting industry self-regulate, uh, ensuring that participation was mandatory, uh, establishing uh, an independent body to oversee the scheme and, and administer it. And, you know, one, one uh, stakeholder said it should be, uh, the, the scheme should have teeth. So if you're not um, uh, following the scheme or not uh, adhering to the requirements, then there should be penalties associated with it. So what are some of the uh, issues or challenges that, um, that I think might be most important. And this is just sort of how I, what I've gleaned from the relatively limited reading I've done on this topic. So one of my previous slides talk showed, showed that accurately accounting for carbon content of hydrogen was a, a priority among state, stakeholders. You know, and the question in this, should we be talking about different colors of hydrogen, blue, green, purple, you know, I've, I've heard lots of colors. Uh, or should we just be uh, talking about uh, kilograms of, of uh, CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen? The, the challenge of boundaries, um, I didn't have a boundary slide. I could have put a boundary slide in yet again, but I thought there's enough coverage of boundaries. But yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. Where do you set it? How is it, how important it is to be compatible with the EU scheme? Should we perhaps just focus on what um, our most likely markets want? In other words, countries in Asia like uh, Japan and Korea, what do they see as important in the scheme? I mean, after all, they are the customers. Um, and the customer is always right. So which should come first, uh, a domestic or a international scheme? Well, I sort of think, well, what, be the, what would be the scheme, what would be the nature of a scheme that was, that most helped an Australian hydrogen industry to grow? Uh, that is after all the objective to get a vibrant and successful innovative hydrogen industry, domestic hydrogen industry. Um, how do we best do that? How does a scheme, what sort of scheme best encourages that to happen? A fourth challenge is perhaps whether um, how compatible this, this idea of having a scheme that, that, that happens next year or within the next two years perhaps, is that give us enough time to make sure that it is well designed? I don't have any answers to these questions, um, but they're interesting things, things to think about. Anyway, I'll, I'll thank you very much for your uh, attention. Uh, and thanks again, Ken and others for the opportunity to participate in, in this uh, forum today. True, thank you very much, John, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, we now have an opportunity to move into a bit of a discussion amongst the panel members. Uh, let me just remind you uh, that uh, you can ask questions in the Q&A uh, panel at the bottom of your screen.
Um, we'd rather you didn't use the chat because we've got to follow two things then, but some of you have already used the chat, so we might look at that too, but let's go with the Q&A panel. Um, they're uh, media present, uh, so these uh, discussions may be reported, so just be uh, aware of that. Um, and uh, we'll try and get through as many questions as we can within the time limit, uh, but we could run over a little bit. So let's see how we go. So uh, I'd like to kick off the discussion uh, by uh, asking a question of the panelists. So uh, we have the opportunity for hydrogen producers uh, who could be completely standalone. Uh, they might um, uh, have a, a solar and wind farm and battery combination, uh, make hydrogen directly, uh, and uh, sell it straight in the export market. Uh, so that's one mode of operation. Another mode might be uh, there'll be uh, hydrogen plants sitting on the grid. Uh, they might have power purchase agreements with renewable suppliers or maybe not. Uh, they might just use, um, you know, spilt uh, uh, solar and wind at opportune times, maybe purchase on a merchant arrangement, who knows. Uh, but they're connected to the grid. And so there is a complication with that given that it's very hard to attribute uh, where the electricity has come from. Has it come from renewables? Has it come from fossil fuels? How do you account for that? Uh, even with a power purchase agreement, you could imagine that suddenly a hydrogen plant turns on uh, and it doesn't know, um, you know, uh, whether uh, that's at a time uh, when, uh, you know, you need to uh, firm up the supply using a gas plant uh, kicking in or maybe even a, a coal plant ramping up this sort of uh, level of uncertainty about the carbon content of the electricity being uh, either purchased or displaced. So that's very complicated. We have to work out a way of dealing with that. Uh, and uh, it's not obvious that we necessarily even have existing schemes that will do deal with that, like uh, large uh, scale generation certificates and the like. Um, so should the exporters of hydrogen who are standalone and don't have to worry about these things be hamstrung by our uh, slowness in getting a hydrogen certification scheme off the ground, or should we just deal with these two opportunities for generating hydrogen for exports separately uh, and, uh, and allow them to uh, run as soon as we uh, have a scheme in place? So I'd be interested to hear the panel's view on that. I can have a go, although I'm hoping others will, will jump in as well. I mean, I think, I think there's two points I'd like to make. One is that a, a big standalone producer, and, and I'm thinking of the Asian Renewable Energy Hub, for example, um, that, are, that are exactly as you described, um, planning to export directly. Uh, they should be able to arrange um, their own sort of access to international markets because of their sheer size and the fact that they're clearly off-grid, clearly um, renewable, um, without needing to wait for a certification scheme. I'm not saying that a certification scheme wouldn't help them and make their life easier, but I would I would think those guys are, are gonna be sort of the, the least troubled by the lack of a certification scheme. I think the ones who are on grid um, and buying their certificates, but as you say, people have doubts about um, whether it's really truly renewable energy. Those are the ones who are really going to need a certification scheme before international buyers I think we'll feel confident about how much is embedded. Um, but that's just my two cents worth. Uh, I guess um, I look at the sort of time frames for these things. And if, if, uh, if as Rebecca says, we're going to have a certification scheme in one or two years, um, will there be any large scale export, you know, uh, facilities on the grid within that time, probably not. So I don't think they're going to be hamstrung by it, but it will be important to see, for them to be able to demonstrate that their, um, their hydrogen is, you know, has a particular carbon content. Um, the, I mean, I guess at the moment, uh, the international community is, is essentially trying to establish the viability of of a, of a hydrogen supply chain. I mean, this is where we're seeing, for example, the Japanese um, building hydrogen supply uh, facilities in countries around the world that are looking at different mechanisms for transporting that hydrogen to, for A, for producing the hydrogen and B, for transporting it to, to Japan. Um, it's, they're all small scale. They're all kind of demonstration scale type of plants. 
they, they're only there really to show that it's feasible and possible and potentially economically viable to, to do that. Once, once they've demonstrated that, the, uh, the, um, uh, it, then it will be you know, a question of scaling up and, and becoming a, 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 a larger exporter. Um, it's, inter- it's instructive to see that uh, the Japanese and the Koreans both have sort of relatively long time frames for when they want to see zero carbon hydrogen coming in through there as an import. Um, I think they recognise that, you know, that it will take time. I mean, that doesn't mean to say that it might not be a commercial advantage for Australia to be able to say, well, we are zero carbon already, so we should have a premium for, for our hydrogen. I might just jump in to sort of look at things through an ammonia lens, uh, noting that the question said hydrogen. Um, Ken, um, but I assume you were also, of course, meant, meant uh, uh, hydrogen fuels. Um, I think uh, the you look at the certification system that has been designed by the European uh, Certify, and and this is again where um, I, I think about geography as being such an important economic determinant. Um, the European uh, countries are relatively close to each other. Um, the hydrogen that's being produced in Europe is uh, able to be transported by gas pipelines. Um, the incentives to convert uh, their hydrogen from Norway, for instance, into ammonia so it can be transported, you know, the sorts of distances we have to transport to, to reach our markets. I'm not sure... Uh, the incentives uh, for for certifying ammonia are as strong in Europe as they are for certifying hydrogen. Um, so I guess uh, that leads me to wonder, um, when it comes to certifying ammonia and and large scale export of ammonia, well, I doubt um, I doubt Europe will be exporting ammonia to the world. There's one thing. Um, and and uh, neither, well, whether or not there are big purchases of, of ammonia for energy is yet to be seen. Um, so again, the dynamics of hydrogen focused um, discussion and, and the level of urgency perhaps for certification of a, uh, as John mentioned, uh, a supply chain for hydrogen internationally, which is perhaps uh, nascent but you know moving fast and it's great to see hydrogen supply chain projects like the one uh, HSC uh, making progress on that front but the ammonia supply chain has been around for a hundred years or longer um, and that is a supply chain that is already quite mature the, the issue is we're no longer putting the ammonia into an explosive manufacturing plant or or into fertilizers we're putting it into a new purpose. So again, um, how soon that large scale ammonia export industry might materialise for Australian producers like the Asian Renewable Energy Hub and others? I'm not sure they're on the same timeline as, as, as supply chains uh, for hydrogen. So again, differential analysis of certification needs is, is really needed, I think, for ammonia. Okay, uh, everybody had a chance. Rebecca, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll just add to that um, sort of slightly and I kind of agree with um, everything that Emma and John said um, as well. But I mean, I think the the approach should be on, we should try and certify all pathways. I think that should be the aim at kind of, and do them all fairly quickly, I guess is the, um, the but, um I mean, the method to apportion um, or to work out the, the fossil fuel component or the re- renewable component of grid electricity, it is a bit of a tricky one, but we're not starting entirely from scratch. And there are methods around that we can use as methods under Inga's, um, I think the um, international standards I referred to take a slightly different approach, but there's an approach there too. So I think in the, the instance of um, 
trying to do something that's fairly quick, fairly simple and aligned with what we've already got, we should be looking at, at how we can draw on those methods um, and certainly, you know, aim to, to keep all technology pathways kind of moving and developing a scheme for all of those. Yeah, that's, that's it. Great. Well, thank you, uh, panel, for that uh, initial kickoff question. So now we have questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, a number of these uh, seem to be questions from different people asking why it's the same thing. So I'll try and uh, synthesize the questions rather than attributing it to one owner or another. Um, so for example, um, uh, there's been a bit of discussion on the chat and also in the Q&A about uh, you know, defining different labels, um, different bands, if you like, uh, a bit like, you know, bands on, uh, on uh, uh, the, you know, con sugar content of food or something like this, you know, similar sort of thing, um, as opposed to having a continuous uh, accounting process for the carbon dioxide that's embedded in the production, transport, et cetera, processes. Um, so this has come up in a couple of questions. So I'd be interested in hearing the panel's view on the pros and cons of a banded system, uh, which might be associated even with colours, versus a continuously uh, variable uh, carbon accounting system. Um, I'm happy to do a go job. Okay, sorry. Um, as long as the bands are clearly defined, uh, then it probably doesn't matter a huge amount. I guess where it gets trickier is if people really want to see uh, zero emissions hydrogen or really the buyers really want zero emissions hydrogen, then they're going to be less happy with something that has green, green hydrogen, say, defined as between so much and so much. Um, they want to know that it's zero emissions uh, and with, they want to know the precise kilograms that are involved. Um, so I think, I think it depends a little bit on who the customer is and, and what they kind of, what their priorities are in terms of emissions associated with the hydrogen. Go on, Penelope. Thanks so much. Um, I think uh, it all comes down to the negotiating forum in some ways. Um, I think obviously it's going to be a lot simpler and, and I understand it's not an uncomplicated matter to even calculate the amount of CO2 and I would say CO2 equivalent emissions per tonne or kilogram, not CO2 emissions because obviously there are other greenhouse gases involved. So, but the amount of CO2 equivalent per tonne uh, emissions, uh, scientists with within a year of arguing with each other, should be able to come up with a, a standard measurement for that. Because I understand a tonne of hydrogen is not a simple thing. <laughs> like there are different intensities or something. I'm not a scientist, but I, I've heard some arguments. Um, so maybe that can be agreed by, I don't know how many, 21 members in IPHE in a year. One would hope, maybe. But if you want to get 21 members of IPHC to agree to what is green in a year or what is blue in a year. I'm not sure that's going to be quite as fast in a negotiation um, uh, to, to get agreement on that. So I guess for me, it comes down to um, what's the negotiating forum? For instance, if the negotiating forum is Japan and Australia, Maybe Japan and Australia can agree what's green and what's blue or what's grey or, or other colours if they want to define them. But again, where's, that may be helpful for, for some rhetorically to be able to say, my hydrogen's green or my ammonia's green. But again, then it all depends on the boundaries. And then you get some critics coming and saying, you're Ammonia isn't green. The solar panels that were produced, they used, I don't know what electricity in making. You get all those life cycle 
criticism starting to come in as well. So what's really green, John? Like, is it productive? We can say in the production boundary, it is green. And don't ask us about everything else because we didn't measure that. So again, something really simple. Everyone can understand CO2 equivalent emissions per tonne. Thank you very much. Our scientists agreed on what a tonne was and what the greenhouse gases were. And let's get on with it. I think you just have to, the simpler, the better. Industry's made this quite clear, I think. Thank you, Ben. Any other contributions? Yeah, can, can I just uh, say, I, I pretty much agree with everything that's been said here. One thing that, I mean, we've, this has been a debate we've been having in the team. I think one thing to remember is that ultimately we're going to end up with a, a like it or not, a regime complex of certification schemes. There will not be just one certification scheme to rule them all. So one way of thinking about this is, is what should be the role of a, a federal government, federal Australian government supported certification scheme, or where should they put their energy? And I would argue that exactly along the lines that Penn has spoken about, they should be just trying to get the information as complete and as clear as possible out there and then various private entities and and you know bilateral and, and plurilateral things can then use that clear and certified quality information to build whatever definition you know of, of green or whatever they want um, at a later stage and I think you know as, as John said there'll be different consumers at different markets with different ideas of what they want that to be so I, I really don't think the Australian government could ever get exactly the right definition of what's green or not green or even in a banded sense um, for all those different markets. So I think, you know, let many flowers bloom according to the, the interests of the consumers on, on what is green or blue or purple or whatever. Um, and, and the government's role is to provide clear and correct information to the market. So there you go, Re Rebecca. It's all easy, you know, do all that. <laughs> and at the same time, remember that the uh, third most common uh, feature to include in a certification was simplicity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I just, um, yeah, like I agree with what Emma and Penn have said. Um, I think, it, yeah, it would take a lot of time to get international agreement over bands or colours. Um, the approach in the strategy was just that we should, in the first instance, track production technology and emissions, and that's enough information for people to make their decisions about what colour it or what band it is. Um, and, and yeah, it's just sort of, and don't forget we need to do this anyway so you can apply your band. It's a, it's a first step anyway. So I think, you know, that's where our focus is for the time being. It's where IPHE's focus is at the moment is just getting that, those building blocks for it right. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember it's not like a food label where anything below a certain <laughs> level is uh, regarded as safe. Uh, every CO2 molecule emitted in a so-called green label still contributes to global warming. So uh, that, I think, uh, speaks of volumes for a continuous carbon accounting system. Uh, great. So uh, w speaking of uh, such things, um, there's been a number of questions uh, up on the chat and on the Q&A about scope-free emissions. And it uh, seems like this is a pretty active uh, debate, uh, particularly, so scope-free emissions, uh, for, for those of you that I'm familiar with it, are basically those emissions emitted outside the um, the corporate entity that is uh, doing the um, uh, the, the uh, contribution to the uh, supply chain process. Um, so, uh, for example, fugitive emissions that occur in the production of methane. Um, uh, if you're a, a, a company that's making hydrogen out of methane, are they? Uh, how are they going to be included in the in the process? Should they be included in the process? So, the question that we've had from a number of our audience is, uh, how do you cope with scope three emissions and uh, particularly fugitive emissions? All right, I'll, I'll have a go. This is a bit of a tricky one, but I guess um, whether it's scope one, two or three depends on whose perspective you're looking at that from. So if you're just the hydrogen production facility, those upstream fugitive emissions are scope three and you wouldn't be required to report that under Engers. But I guess, if you look at the boundary well to gate that we've been talking about, um, you could think of it as kind of coping, um, counting that like scope one and scope two emissions at each point along that. So you'd scope, count the scope one and two associated with the fossil fuel extraction, scope one and two associated with the transport, scope one and two associated with the hydrogen production. Um, so it's a little bit complicated, but 
um, I think that that's how I've been looking at these sort of well to gate boundaries anyway, but happy for other perspectives on, on this. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Rebecca, that's a very good point to make, but I, I would contend it depends on whose gate it is, right? Um, so uh, let's not talk about a gate. Let's talk about, I don't know, um, well to, um, to uh, uh, methane pipeline end or something like this, but uh, the gate is really dependent on who uh, the, the entity is that's uh, contributing at the, at the last point in the chain. So uh, it's a little bit of a... a um, yeah a difficult uh, terminology in that regard. But yeah. I agree with you. And I, I guess I'd like to add to that where, yeah, I mean, scope three is very difficult to calculate. Um, and it is our intention to keep this simple <laughs> and aligned with the existing frameworks, but that well to gate, yeah, that, that's a sort of slightly broader boundary than Engers. Um, but if we're going to be internationally consistent, we might have to look at how, how we do that, I guess, yeah. Yeah, again, that simplicity is, is the important thing. I agree with you, Rebecca. I think if you, once you move, start to try and work out what scope three emissions are, then you very quickly become a, a very challenging can of worms to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just to clarify, I think I personally think that's a great idea, right? So, so scope one and two isn't sufficient if you're just talking about an entity potentially buying gas from someone else. But if you're saying, but we're sort of going to fudge it a bit and make the scope one and two go back down the supply chain all the way to the well, then I think that's actually a really intelligent um, approach to not dealing with the complexity of all scope three emissions, but getting those big order of magnitude, you know, 25% ones into the scheme in an in a efficient way. Yeah, so I think there's scope to narrow it, if you like, within that broader boundary. That doesn't quite make sense. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's not that we'd have to count. You've got your world of gate boundary, but you don't have to cope all, count all scope three emissions within that. Um, but I think this is some of the detail that we need to sort of look at um, through the, you know, for, that we're looking at currently and from now on. So. Very good, thank you. Um, so uh, let's uh, just look at a, a couple more questions here. Um, so uh, there's uh, been a bit of discussion about um, uh, how blockchain uh, lends itself to this type of process. Um, and uh, depending on uh, what your uh, background is, uh, we might need a bit of explanation for the audience as to how that might work. Uh, what do people think about uh, the application of blockchain to this type of certification process? We'd like to have a go. Um, I'm not an expert on blockchain, but I can say that it was discussed, uh, I think, on the 28th of August at the Ammonia Energy Association's National Conference, and there were people who understood it who had a great conversation and I, I heard it. Um, but basically it's one of the candidates is what, from what I understand from the experts. Uh, and there are all sorts of issues about the veracity of the data that would be included. Blockchain's one potential technology that could be used. It has its downsides as do other types of technology that could be used. So it's all about the uh, depend the reliability of the data is absolutely paramount. There's no use having a system uh, of certification which which uh, you know gets called into question in terms of whether the data is correct or not. So um, I think I, that's just what I wanted to say. I think there needs to be conversations amongst data management experts. And, and verification and certification experts to look at these sorts of options and come up with with the best the best system that suits us, uh, including us as Australians, with with the particular characteristics of our products and our markets and our capabilities. Obviously, when you design these things, you need to bear in mind if you're doing a global system. How will this work for the South African producers who want to or don't want to join this certification system? The Chilean producers, the, you know, we're talking about 
Morocco is is laying down their their you know the, this is going to be international. So again, designing something that's awesome for Australia, but then can't be replicated in other countries easily, may present opportunities for us for capacity building, or may just mean they go with their own system. So I'll just stop with that. But yeah, it's an important question. Anybody else like to weigh in on blockchain? People are doing that on the chat, I see. Well, I'm not a blockchain expert, so but but what I from what I understand about it, it it's uh, one of its strengths might be that it's um, uh, reasonably uh, safe way of passing on a certificate, um, avoiding sort of duplication and double counting things like that. Um, that's that's about all I know. So, but yeah. Blockchain experts of the world can work it out. Good. Um, so let's move on to another question. Uh, so there's been a discussion uh, uh, around the use of uh, certificates um, like renewable, renewable energy certificates uh, being used to trade uh, between, uh, you know, customers and suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can, potentially uh, issue a certificate uh, based on a certain level of uh, CO2 content um, below a threshold perhaps and, and have these traded. So what do the panel think about such a, a, a certificate trading scheme as a, an option? Is someone suggesting carbon market? <laughs> Uh, well, Sorry, had to do it. Had to do it. Academic by, economist. By by default, yes. But the you know the renewable energy energy certificates that are um, uh, around here in Australia um, have a, a similar basis. Yeah, um, I think in the first instance we're just looking at um, certifying and tracking the emissions associated with production. Like a guarantee of origin scheme, so to say. There's you know, no hydrogen targets or, or anything like that to, to set up that sort of regime. Um, yeah. It's... Any other views? Of course, it might be said that if we had a, uh, uh, a universal global uh, carbon uh, trading system that we wouldn't be having this discussion tonight because it will all be done by that, but uh, we don't. So hence we uh, need certification to uh, be able to determine the carbon content of various products and uh, and to influence uh, the uh, the saleability and uh, the um, uh, the demand for, for such products. Uh, any other commentary on uh, on the certificates idea? Just quickly, while you know, it, it's great to be as inclusive in in what's being priced into the you know emissions as possible. Of course, on the other hand, if we start having lots of somewhat complicated and Australian specific, you know, Australian regulatory regime specific components in our regime, it will undermine um, trust and confidence in our scheme uh, with overseas markets, potentially. And that, and that confidence, having confidence in the scheme, uh, both among, you know, the the sellers and buyers is crucial, particularly though among buyers, you know, they, they've got to be confident that they're getting what they're paying for. And the buyers, um, the sellers rather, they have um, an incentive because they are hoping probably that they'll get a price premium for, um, you know, for hydrogen with, with low, low or zero um, emissions associated with it. So, Having confidence that you've you've got got a scheme that that is trustworthy is good. Perhaps yeah. I'll just um, say, and and John, you referred to buyers and sellers, and um, and this comes down to again geography, perhaps um, that a system that can be negotiated globally around these issues involves a lot of different buyers and a lot of different sellers with a lot of different preferences. 
as reflected by them at perhaps the negotiating positions of their respective governments. And, and um, again, I, I, the way I see it, it's not an either or. I think definitely a multilateral agreement around certification is ideal as per the hydrogen strategy, and we should be actively engaging in, in that as, as we are. Um, but at the same time, as we all know, um, things happen at multilateral level, at regional level, and at bilateral level. Uh, often simultaneously with different parties and different um, conversations and priorities. So again, when we talk about buyers and sellers, I guess the sellers we're most concerned about, of course, are the ones in Australia. And the buyers, again, that we're most concerned about are the ones we're likely to actually sell to. So um, it'd just be interesting to, and, and I know that um, Rebecca and her team are, are in you know, uh, looking at those those international relationships that are probably going to be the highest priority uh, to Australian sellers. Yeah, so so it's a complex picture, but I just want to make that point. Yeah, at the end of the day, we want we want a scheme that's good for Australia. Um, we, you know, if if a if an internationally accepted scheme is bad for us, then we're better off having something that's good for our, good, a better scheme that's acceptable to our customers uh, and good for Australia. Can I provide a dissenting opinion? It just depends on what you define as good for Australia. Like, as an academic, as opposed to a member of uh, government, I think good for the world um, and avoiding catastrophic climate change is actually the number one priority for the certification scheme. I don't think, I, don't, I think uh, as I made the point earlier, I said, I don't think people or countries are going to be interested in importing hydrogen with lots of emissions associated with them in the, in the medium term. By that, you know, they're not, we're not going to be able to sell lots of dirty hydrogen, put it that way. Yes, and that actually uh, segues nicely, John, into a question that's been asked here, which um, talks about the EU moving towards border adjustments for carbon content, uh, particularly in en embedded energy products. Um, the US has uh, also had some thoughts down the same lines. Um, so uh, wouldn't, uh, so the question is really, um, you know, wouldn't uh, certification uh, schemes uh, like this uh, greatly uh, facilitate the implementation of such border adjustments and give you exactly the, um, the information that's needed to uh, enable uh, countries uh, like this just to simply lay another policy completely over the top of the certification scheme and thereby um, make use of the work already done in, uh, in the accounting processes for embedded carbon. So uh, that's the question for the panel. Can I um, use some of the information that I have from our um one of our wonderful secondees, uh, Alison Reeve, who's just started with us. Uh, interestingly, the European Certify Scheme boundary doesn't exactly line up with the way it looks like their border tariff adjustment is going to work. So the Certify Scheme boundary with the fugitive emissions, for example, lines up with their fuel directives, um, whereas the border tariff adjustment looks like it's going to line up with their emissions trading scheme and transport is not part of the ETS. So it's strictly one scope one and two. Um, so actually there, there is a conflict even in the European approach um, on that. So it's not clear um, how that's going to land for Australia, except noting that um, transport, which is, well, it depends because hydrogen and ammonia can be used both in industry and transport. And there's a danger that they'll be treated differently depending on what the end user is. Other comments on border adjustments? No? We, um, we still have uh, a number of questions, but I uh, make note that uh, we're now well over our allotted time. Uh, if people have uh, specific questions of information that they'd like to know about, uh, then please add that to the Q&A panel uh, we will endeavour to answer those questions where you're after a specific piece of information. Uh, and I see that there have been a number of those. Um, they're not more general questions that would be good for discussion, but uh, if you're after information, uh, we'll certainly do our best to uh, 
provide that. So uh, you're welcome to uh, look at that. We will be capturing what's on the Q&A panel, but also on the chat. Um, and uh, where appropriate, uh, we will be able to respond uh, to, those, uh, to those queries. Um, so I think uh, that might be a good time to wrap things up. Uh, we've had a really uh, well-engaged audience. Uh, we still have uh, more than half of the audience uh, with us, so that's always a good sign. Uh, the questions have been extremely uh, appropriate and, uh, and insightful, uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, interest out there in this topic. Uh, we at the ANU in the Energy Change Institute and in the Grand Challenge Zero Carbon Energy for the Asia Pacific uh, will be researching these questions in uh, great detail over the coming months and uh, we hope to uh, contribute to uh, the uh, information uh, that underpins uh, the understanding of certification schemes and make this obviously available to the uh, uh, National Hyd Hydrogen Task Force um, where Rebecca is uh, is located. So um, uh, we will continue to uh, uh, undertake that role. Um, and uh, and uh, if uh, people have ideas that they'd like to contribute, we'd be most uh, uh, welcoming of, uh, of receiving those ideas. So uh, let me now just uh, finish up uh, by once again thanking our panellists, uh, Rebecca Thompson, uh, Emma Aisbert, Penn Howarth and John Soderbaum. Uh, I think it's been a terrific discussion and uh, we'd like to also thank the audience uh, and uh, just a quick advertisement uh, in a couple of weeks time uh, we'll have another public forum this time it'll be about Australia as the uh, renewable energy superpower so keep your eye open for that uh, and that'll be uh, happening on the uh, 24th of September I believe uh, so uh, go to the, our website and, uh, and register for that and we look forward to seeing you all then. And thank you again, everybody. And uh, uh, good evening and, uh, and uh, have, a, have a safe uh, rest of the week.